Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ken Gracie, CEO of Parallax, and I'm the Zoom, Zoom ground station control for today's presentation. Um, I'll provide one minute of housekeeping before introducing Andy Lindsay of Parallax and Tommy Gober of cyber.org. So today we're providing a progress report on the new Parallax curriculum called What's a Microcontroller with Python and the Microbit. This presentation is for educators. Um, this is the first of two part series. The next one is in March. And through this presentation, we will post a link in the chat so you can go there and register. <clears throat> but we'll also send it to you afterwards. Today we're using Zoom, of course. Everybody knows what that means. You have control of your microphone and camera. Um, I have systematically muted everybody, but welcome you to unmute yourself anytime you want to say something. It's always good to have some two-way dialogue during these meetings. Makes it a lot more fun. Um, if you don't want to do that, feel free to use chat. And the co-host, Tommy, will bring it to Andy's attention. So we definitely have a significant amount of material to cover in the next hour, and we're here to ask you a number of questions, too. This is really a progress check-in between us and teachers. Um, I have some thank yous to make. First, I'd like to thank you uh, to cyber.org for including us in this important effort. Um, cyber.org is funded by the United States government through the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Wow, a lot of words. And because of their support, our developer, Andy, has been able to focus on this curriculum for months at a time and will be able to do so through June, which is very helpful. And it's been an absolute relief to have that support um, because we could really take our time, get it right, and be the first to release a very complete Python tutorial with electronics in the micro bit. So thanks a lot, cyber.org, for your help. We also want to thank the Microbit Educational Foundation who creates the Microbit. Thanks to Katie, who is here, the head of Microbit Partnerships, for her support in our outreach. Uh, the new Microbit 2.0 has plenty of sensors and processing power to run the MicroPython interpreter. If you're a high school teacher, we find this tool now very powerful for those students. We think it will be engaging, challenging, and our goal for the teachers is to give you a very turnkey curriculum, just to make your job a lot easier because we know it's not been that way this year. <clears throat> now the hour we're looking forward to. I'd like to introduce our main presenters to you. First off, Anzi Lindsay is an electronic engineer and an educational author with Parallax. He's worked with us for 23 years which have been very productive. He's particularly skilled at communicating engineering concepts through code, images, and curriculum. And his prior books include What's a Microcontrol in Robotics? These have been distributed in up to half a million copies. We lost count, and they were translated to seven different languages. He's also one of the nicest people I know. Andy's presented, or co-presenter is Tommy Gober of cyber.org. Tommy is a doctoral candidate at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, and a curriculum development specialist at cyber.org. Tommy knows so much about curriculum design, e-learning, programming, and presentation, and is my source when I need to know what I don't know. He reads everything. And Tommy's been directing Andy's efforts from cyber.org. So Andy, passing off to you. All right, thank you, Ken, Tom, Tommy, and uh, Katie for coming and cyber.org and <clears throat> all of you, it's great to see you all. Um, here we go on the screen share. All right, so this is uh, part one of the project we're working on. And uh, as you can probably see from the, uh, this cover screen, it's, it's an electronics intro. Um, that is uh, a little bit beyond what you would might normally connect to the microbit. And uh, this breadboard and the lessons that I've been developing um, are going to make it uh, very easy for students to make that next step from uh, some of the things you might have seen them doing on Make It Code It. Um, let's see here. Okay, so um, there has been a lot of under the hood development going on and uh, we're at that transition phase between, okay, can we get all the applications to work? Is this going to be something that the students can succeed at? Um, do we have the parts that allow us to charge the, the lowest price we can to you teachers for the, um, for the kit? Do we, do we have 
but at the same time, do we have parts <clears throat> that can give it um, educational value and wow value? Um, we've developed some software that will uh, help reinforce some of the comment, some of the concepts that are going to be introduced, um, and and we've also uh, developed some new visual support elements that will um, help make uh, some otherwise difficult to grasp things easier to understand. Um, so today uh, I would like to talk about um, an example chapter uh, and um, the, the, the top priority is to get your feedback now so that we know that we've got everything um, set so that when, when I start posting uh, more chapters as, act, as web activities that, um, that we can move forward with confidence that it's what you need. So your feedback at this juncture is crucial. Um, so uh, today is part one of that. Um, and then we're going to, in a month, uh, take a look at some of uh, some more stuff um, with some additional wow value, by the way. This is, um, we're working on very foundational material right now. So um, next, next month, um, we'll do some wow value demos in addition to the foundation stuff. Uh, so let's see, anything else to say about this slide? Um, Yep, that's that's about it. Okay, so here is the kit. Um, lots of parts, and I want to emphasize that these are real parts that um, that are used in real product designs. And by experimenting with them in uh, this particular uh, kind of prototyping environment, uh, students will get um, get to experience what it what it takes, what goes inside products, uh, which is also um, which are also things that they can use to put inside inventions. Um, that's a, a very important uh, distinction. And so um, I'd like to take you to the, the product page of the kit. It just came up a couple hours ago. Um, so uh, for individual kits, it's $89. I don't know anything about whether or not there's um, any kind of discount for multiple kits. I'll have to let Ken step in on that. Um, so here is pretty much that same picture. Um, and then here is one where uh, we have an example of uh, just basically a whole bunch of stuff thrown on the breadboard uh, as a uh, potential student invention. And um, the nice thing is that it, it can contain quite a few circuits without uh, becoming overwhelming. It can all, you know, this particular breadboard and this particular adapter that we've developed um, allow us to connect a lot of things to the micro bit without um, anything getting too uh, difficult to create, or uh, here is the adapter, by the way, uh, without it, uh, things getting, um, really difficult to visually track. It, it can stay uh, organized in a left to right kind of way for the most part. Now, um, if, if any of you are seeing this and going, oh boy, that looks dangerous, that looks complicated, don't worry. I'm gonna be uh, showing you how you and your students can pick this up um, with, without any overwhelming amount of effort. Okay, back to the slide. See here. All right. Um, now, uh, this also, uh, for those of you who are using it in the classroom, we have a, a refresher pack because uh, we know that um, parts get lost. And so, uh, if you buy a couple of these, if, if your student says, oh, gee, I, I lost three of these parts, you can um, go ahead and break open one of these packages and, and replenish their kit, and they'll be off and running. Um, that's an important feature. And uh, please do feel free to um, hit up Tommy with, or, you know, hit up the chat with questions or unmute yourself and jump in if you want to ask something. Um, you know, Small item, Andy, just check to see that your microphone is not near, I think, your mouse. I don't know if the microphone input is on your. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Now that sounds better. Okay. Thanks. Let's see here. Hey, Andy. Oh, uh, good. Yeah, that's what's bouncing hey. around. Okay. Andy, do you know offhand uh, what the price of the uh, the little um, connector would be? I mean, the um, micro bit. Of... Oh, the connector. Yes, I can look that up. Fourteen ninety-five. 
Thank well, that's you. That's not bad. Yeah, we could start with that. That's awesome. Actually, Andy, that helps since yeah, the microphone's not bouncing around on your lapel now is much better. Okay, great. Um, go ahead and let me know, please, if I start making noise again. Uh, let's see here, view, present. Um, Andy also wanted to kind of situate this with, um, so the kit you guys see here on the screen, um, a lot of these parts, um, if you have already played with um, the Cyberbot, which is the microbit, um, robot platform. Um, it comes with a lot of these parts, but it doesn't have all of the parts. And the what's a microcontroller kit, you know, it, historically, if you've been with Parallax for a while, you may have already seen the what's a microcontroller kit for the basic stamp. But I wanted to, um, you know, like, like Andy said, you look at all that at that build and it's kind of like, whoa, that's scary. It looks complicated. It's not. Um, it, it all builds up in baby steps along the way. And before I ever got into education at all, just as a hobbyist, um, and the first time I met Andy, uh, we kind of laughed about this story, but I used to go to Radio Shack quite a bit and I would always see this really cool looking kit called What's a Microcontroller on the Shelf. And I thought that looks neat. I, I wanna play with that. Um, yeah, there's the original text there, uh, top right corner. And then the bottom uh, left corner there has the, the parts that you uh, got with that kit. The brains of that kit was the basic stamp. And so you would use those parts with the basic stamp and you'd learn some basic programming. You'd already, you'd have some circuits built. And as a hobbyist, I was always like at this kind of, this junction where I was so, so, so confused. I was like, okay, um, I'm, I, I cam radio. I'm into playing ham radio and whatnot in five DUX. Um, but if you, if you know how to build circuits on a, on a breadboard, a little simple circuit, but then you're like, and I know how to program, where do the two meet? And that's really the, the value I found as a hobbyist, just exploring on my own of the what's a microcontroller text. Uh, Andy did a phenomenal job uh, putting that text together, explaining all the components that are in that kit. And then you can see here, the kit that he's got on the screen is much, uh, you know, there's a lot more parts in this one. The, uh, the brains of this kit is no longer the, the basic stamp, though you can still get the basic stamp wham kit um wham what's a microcontroller uh but this one is using the micro bit and you're using the python programming language rather than the uh, p basic programming language on the basic stamp so for me um what i was able to do is i was able to join my two interests of um <clears throat> of building circuits and coding put them together with this platform and then later i got into the cyber i got into the the bobot which was the robot platform at the time um and I was able to hit the ground running because of the lessons I had learned from this kit. So that's kind of puts you, you know, it, where I think it kind of fits into a, a progression or a spectrum of learning um, with these different kits. You can certainly, if you already have the, the cyber bot, you could obviously go back um, and revisit some of this because this does have some parts that are not included with the cyber bot. There are some more advanced builds, uh, some, some deeper understandings are, um, are kind of laid bare with this kit. But the two work wonderfully well if you're looking for a progression of what do I do leading into the Cyberbot or what do I have coming after the Cyberbot? Uh, this kit is going to be your answer on that side. So sorry to steal all that, Andy. I just I thought that would be good to kind of situate it. Oh, no. Thank you, Tommy, for, for uh, sh <laughs> sharing that experience and, and uh, giving some of the background. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll have some more to add to that actually, uh, right here. Um, so what's a microcontroller is, um, it's a series of lessons at, that goes with a kit and it's uh, going to be designed to get anybody started, but um, with, with inventing uh, kind of as a, a next step after say, connecting some very simple circuits to the micro bit with an alligator clip, this is, this is a very nice next step uh, to, in, in complexity. Um, and uh, so there will be some directly accessible uh, maker and STEM type tutorials, but uh, to the best of my ability, I'm going to include uh, pre-engineering material as well. Um, uh, some of that's on a personal note. It's, it's because I've, I saw in engineering school, a lot of students who had trouble because they had no prior experience and, and some of the expectations in, in the classes um, uh, were that 
that that the uh, that the students had some prior experience uh, with uh, taking measurements and doing certain calculations. And so uh, one of our goals is is to incorporate that. It's also very empowering because um, you can actually use a calculator to figure out if you're selecting the right part in many cases. And that was uh, one of the more common questions I got from the original What's a Microcontroller because we kept it qualitative. And because of that, we could not necessarily address the thing of, hey, I wanna design something into an invention, um, but I don't know, you know what the laws and math are to, to you know, make the decision of which resistor to select. Um, as far as standards and class time, um, it's mostly going to be your state CTE engineering uh, computer and electrical pathways. Um, Tommy graciously offered uh, to, on behalf of cyber.org, uh, speak with any of you who have questions about where the best fit is going to be for the kit. I, correct me if I'm wrong on that, Tommy. That's what I, okay, I got a nod there. Um, uh, it's looking like 40 class hours, but that's a fairly conservative estimate. I could see it going up. Um, some of that will depend on how much uh, I get done by uh, third week of June, we shall see. Um, now, as far as using it with the Cyberbot, um, I have heard quite a number of, of um, arguments for, well, gee, I need my kids to be excited and engaged first, so I'm going to introduce the robot first. Um, you know, 10 minutes later in the same educators course, I ran into another teacher who said, hey, look, I, you know, I need my kids, you know, I have a slightly different cl class situation and my, my group needs to be well versed in the theory and the underlying principles of the circuit circuits before they connect them to the site, you know, the robot. And, um, and then uh, personally, I, I would actually like to try interweaving the two kits. Um, so, so I really feel that it can be a before, an after, or a with or a without the cyberbot and the cybersecurity curricula. Uh, so quick little side step on that at learn.parallax.com. Um, so here we are at learn.parallax.com and uh, the Cyberbot page is right here. And let me see if I can paste that in because I, I want everybody to know where this is. Um, chat. Hmm. Try chat one more time. I'm afraid it may have come up below another window. Let's see. I just saw it. Okay, paste. All right, so this is this is a page uh, for the Cyberbot, and this is the student resource page. And uh, I just wanted to let you know it's it's here. It's, it starts with some uh, microbit programming tutorials, um, and then these are the Cyberbot tutorials for anybody who is not aware of this. It's a it's an outstanding resource for. Um, some uh, some robotics lessons and some introductory cybersecurity lessons as well, kind of some of the classical looks at, at uh, what's underneath cybersecurity principles. Okay, back to, I think John might be interested in this. We've got the encryption or maybe he's seen it already in, the, um, in uh, some of the cyber.org uh, usages of this material. Okay, so that, that is something to be aware of. And then the other one is on the educators link at learn.parallax.com. Uh, there are cyberbot resources. And one of the things you can do is, is just kind of to get a quick idea of uh, the general range of standards you'd be looking at. There's a, a cyberbot standards matrix that you can download and, and review. And uh, that, that should give you um, Kind of a, a general ballpark of where this kit is also going to fit, although it will have a little bit more math, science, and um, engineering uh, concepts and checkboxes that are checked off than, than what you'll find there. Okay, any questions before I move on? So obviously this is going to look a little different from state to state. 
whether you are um, middle school, high school, higher ed. Um, and that's where uh, Andy said, you know, happy to chat with you guys about what this um, would look like, what standards are you uh, referencing, um, or what standards do you need to meet, and then uh, how this all aligns. Uh, I had the question earlier, does this align with any um, certifications? It doesn't right now, um, but of course, if you have a target in mind, we can uh, work with you on putting that, putting that together. Um, a lot of this content, though, is just really kind of good to know if you're going to enter electrical engineering, um, circuit design, computer engineering, um, any of that kind of hands on with circuits. This is going to make it uh, far more tangible um, than just kind of some of the, the theory in labs that a lot of us may have learned from. Um, so, you know, a lot of good content in here, um, but the, the standards change so much that uh, please do reach out if you need any assistance on uh, getting the stuff aligned with uh, whatever your needs are. And what Tommy said about tangible, more on that soon. Um, okay, so uh, this is uh, some of the basics that are um, presented. The, the, this circuit I built up, and again, next month we'll be uh, speaking about some of the more uh, high level stuff. Um, so as far as the basics, some of the critical things um, that happen to also be common parts used in inventions are indicator lights. Those are examples of binary outputs. Push buttons would be binary inputs to the system. Uh, as far as an analog output, a servo motor that can basically point in just about any direction within a 180 degree range is a, an example of an analog or you know, continuously variable output. Um, the, uh, for analog sensors, we have this nice little, uh, oh, by the way, here are the indicator lights. Here are some push buttons. And these two things, yes, they exist on the micro bit. And so one of, one of the common questions I've encountered is, well, gee, how, how would I make one of those uh, you know, how would I add a third push button, you know, or a fourth if you want to consider the uh, the touch sensor to be your third push button that's on the V2 micro bit. Uh, well, now the students will know how to build them, what goes inside them, how they work, um, and how to program the micro bit to speak with peripheral push button inputs to control peripheral LED light outputs um, to measure a peripheral um, analog input of a uh, rotation, a, 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 an adjustment knob, a, a potentiometer is its uh, circuit name. And then there's also a photo transistor. And then uh, not shown are some integrated circuits, including an infrared object detector, uh, transistors, and an amplifier. And so those are all uh, very important um, uh, things inside of inventions. And again, this looks really complicated. Again, don't worry, we got you covered. Um, here is an example of uh, building a light circuit. And this is actually even before connecting the light circuit uh, to the micro bit, just building a light circuit that turns on. And um, some of the pre-engineering material here uh, has to do with using um, instrumentation. You know, that, that notice uh, some alligator clips here connected to uh, the microbits P0 and uh, P2 pins. These um, alligator clips are can be used to as a voltmeter. And uh, so we're actually probing this resistor. We're measuring the voltage across it, and we're seeing in a schematic. Uh, how the schematic looks and how the um, and where the probes are going on the schematic, what the measured voltage is. This is great for reinforcing many key electrical concepts that again I, I see students having difficulty with. And we're not just going to do this for electrical um, in in terms of things that are hard to grasp in the programming realm. We want to bring that and make it accessible. And then likewise in the computer realm, uh, the those are, those are areas where we have plans for um, basically making stuff accessible that used to be um, not really the kind of thing you ran into until you hit it really hard in engineering school. Um, this, uh, this lab equipment sometimes can cost um, a fair amount of money. For example, an oscilloscope 
uh, is something where you're measuring uh, voltages that varies over time. Well, uh, we're using these same alligator clips to actually take oscilloscope measurements. And this will al allow um, uh, bringing home um, important ideas like RC decay, which is exponential decay that has, um, it's, you know, it's an application of math. Um, it's, of course, a fundamental in circuit theory, and, um, and it has to do with the way certain sensors uh, respond electrically. And so it's, it's a great lesson to be able to drive home and to be able to say, okay, well, you just tried calculating RC decay. Let's measure RC decay with our microbit. I see that uh, Mike was just holding up his, um, his prop scope, which is a, a parallax oh. product. And <laughs> Yeah. So the great thing about the prop scope is that um, it can capture a whole lot more samples uh, at once than the micro bit can. Uh, but again, there's also the the cost of of that kind of device. And if if you just need it for a, a quick introduction to what is an oscilloscope, what does it do for me? Um, like Andy said, it's taking voltage measurements over time. Um, it's basically this is an extension of the analog to digital converter on the micro bit. So it's just capturing those samples and then doing it over time. And Andy has done an incredible job with this product. This was, uh, Andy, we were talking, it was, it was an evening. Uh, I think I was even walking around Target talking to you on my cell phone. And it was just like, <laughs> you know, it'd be cool. And he's like, wow, that would be cool. And, and here we are with it. Um, just truly incredible stuff that he's put together with this. Um, I will say, uh, caveat, right, Andy? It's okay. It's not the fastest. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the fastest indeed. Um, in fact, I, I uh, part of the parts choices had to do with making sure that the uh, circuits would respond slowly enough electrically so that we could capture uh, these. Um, as far as souping it up, yeah, uh, you know, every mechanic loves their car to be as fast as it can be. And I have uh, lots of plans for improving this, but um, it's really exciting that, that we can capture stuff like what you see on the screen. And again, this, this, this is another uh, topic that will be uh, covered in more detail in the next session. All right, so uh, I wanna um, go over some of the visual aids that we have included. Now this one, I have the video uh, ready to play, but instead I'm going to bring it up in the tutorials. Okay, so uh, this is the page that there, this appears on. Um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and paste that into, uh, if anybody feels like opening another tab and taking a look at that, browsing around. This is, uh, this is the um, example chapter that we have published for your review, uh, but also for your review is going to be um, some uh, material that is not published. And we, we're gonna need to know from you uh, how, to, uh, how to distribute that to you and the students most effectively. Um, so as you can hopefully see from this GIF, uh, we tried to make it clear even in the constraint of 624 pixels on a web page. But um, in addition to that, uh, I set up the full resolution video. I hope it looks as clear for you as it does for me. Um, we chose to use uh, the use uh, animated drawings as opposed to uh, shooting it with a camera because um, the uh, the video footage introduces visual noise. Um, what this one of the one of the important things about animating it is that it removes a lot of the elements that would otherwise uh, potentially detract from what we're trying to convey. And so I, I just want to emphasize that um, you know when when things look complicated like in some of those um, initial slides where i had these giant circuits you know with a whole bunch of sub circuits on there that uh, we're, we're supporting you through every single step of getting to be able to build those kind of circuits and be confident in doing so for the sake of inventing all right so um so that is an example of uh what's in the slideshow. Oh, and another thing, um, I'm gonna reopen this, sorry. Um, another thing is right here. Okay, so let's say that you're a student and you're trying to build along. Okay, so you can hit pause if you uh, open the MP4 link 
which is the full size video, as opposed to the GIF that's just kind of sitting in the uh, in the in the web page, just so that you can see what's going on. Sure, you can do it straight out of the GIF, but um, you can actually hit pause and take a very close look and, and take a little bit longer to absorb uh, what's going on in the MP4. Um, so, so that's an important feature is that we have the GIF so you can see at a glance as you're going through the tutorials, but we also have the MP4, which is a higher resolution version that you can pause at each step. Now the steps are also um, in words down below the animation. Um, so that's the first example of, of visual, and I didn't want to play it. I wanted to move to the next slide. Let's try. There we go. Hey, All Andy, right. Yeah. I don't want to be controversial, but when did we switch over to GIF? Um, I've always called it GIF. Some anybody? people are wrong in life. <laughs> <laughs> Well, was Sorry. that was that me or was that Mark? <laughs> no, I, I don't know. It wasn't me. I, uh, I have no idea. I never been... called it. I never called it GIF, and then all of a sudden, everybody started calling it GIF. I don't know. It's just curious. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I I don't know if anybody has the official. Uh... The internet debate continues. The the creator calls it GIF, but I think oh, ninety really? percent of the internet says he's wrong. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, well, Fox Populi. Um, uh, given that that given the ninety ten rule, uh, is everybody okay if I continue to call it GIF? All right, I'm I'm just going to do that unless somebody screams, "Stop it, Andy!" Pronounce it GIF. Um, how to connect two wires? Let's look at that. I I felt um, that this was one of the biggest stumbling blocks. It seemed like the kind of thing we always had to talk about um, in educators courses. And I'm actually gonna go back and play this uh, directly in the slide. Hopefully it'll be as clear. Okay. Um, so first step is to shade all the little sub connections. And um, again, this is something where uh, we talk about it in educators courses and a lot of folks have to do several rounds with it until they feel confident. And so this is another place where I'm, you know, putting some extra effort into meticulously showing how do things work in a video format that can be paused. Uh, for example, if, uh, if you're talking about this in class, you can download this MP4 and you can show uh, the students and, and pause at critical points. And, you know, even for example, you can pause before the connected uh, flag has displayed. And you can say, all right, well, is this connected or not connected? Hit play. And the result is connected. And, uh, and so this, this is how we show people, how do you make electrical connections? And we go through and, and show some examples emphasizing that each one, uh, emphasizing that connecting a pair of wires into the same row of five sockets is the trick to making sure that those two wires are connected together. For example, the wires that just said not connected are in a separate row of five across the little valley in the center. That little valley in the center, however, can be connected by a jumper wire so that instead of not connected, the wires can be connected. So. Um, Again, another example of video resources. I am, by the way, uh, playing you several videos. Uh, this is leading up to some, to, you know, to some questions that we have for you, which is why I'm taking you through it. Um, this breadboard is really great in that uh, it also has what are called bus strips. So uh, unlike the Cyberbot, which only has terminal strips, which we looked at just a minute ago with the rows of five sockets, we also have these columns. And these are what make it basically easy to connect power to any circuit and have every, every circuit be buildable from left to right. Um, and as you can see, uh, we are showing people in a very step-by-step -step fashion how that works. And that is uh, in addition to hands-on measuring it, 
uh, using some of the equipment that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in this case, they program the microbit to be what's called a continuity tester. And they actually, um, all the things that we saw in the video, the activities take you through probing it. Um, see, I'm running short on time, so I gotta speed it up here. Let's see, next slide. Um, so this one uh, is setting power to circuits. I'll just play it for you real quick and not pause it a lot. But uh, this, this shows uh, how you have access to three volts. And again, th these are the kind of things where you get to see a clip of it, you get to read a, an explanation of it, you get to, um, and then you get to actually use the micro bit as a piece of test equipment to discover and verify that, you know, those columns next to the blue lines on the breadboard really are ground or zero volts and the columns next to the red line really are uh, three volts. And uh, so here is an example of um, taking the measurements, I believe. Again, these are all in the, the tutorials that I showed earlier. I'll show them to you again. Oh, I wanted to pause on this one. Um, so I think this is uh, really important. And um, I think it's a great opportunity. And again, it, it's uh, one of the reasons that I'm so grateful to um, cyber.org for uh, joining in and making it so that we can uh, make something greater. And uh, that is, let's see here. Sorry, technical difficulties. Let's try this again. Okay, I'm hitting play and I can't get to the pause button. There we go. Okay, so um, right here, uh, we have a schematic, a little, a little white thing for a schematic appearing. We've got the parts, which earlier in the activity were uh, demonstrated as, you know, hey, these are the parts, these are their names, these are what the schematic symbols look like. Now, at this point, um, notice a black line or a, uh, a black jumper wire was just connected. And um, I just caught an issue with this. This is the wrong video. This is an older version of the video. The, have the jumper wires across the yeah, top. Yeah, the, the power <laughs> jumper wires are missing. So we, I have to. Um, but you can imagine. Yeah, you'll have to. <laughs> um, and we'll get that fixed pretty shortly. Uh, all right. So anyway, if, if we imagine that the power jumper wires are correctly connected and that I gave our editor the correct video instead of the wrong one, um, we can uh, see that, hey, you add a jumper wire and you've got a connection to ground. That's the schematic symbol. And then the next thing to get uh, plugged in is the green LED. So here we have the green LED and here we have it in the schematic. So you're seeing the physical, the visual construction of the circuit alongside the schematic. And, and this is one of the things Andy's saying, he's grateful to us coming along. This is actually his idea back in WAM kit 1.0 was um, this whole progression of doing things visually alongside the schematic, it reinforces the schematic understanding. And this is one of the things that I love about um, the way that Parallax puts together the tutorials is it shows you building this rather than just saying, okay, here's a schematic, good luck. You get a, a <laughs> kind of a pictorial of what it should look like uh, when, you're, when you're completing. Yeah, and also the original WAM, what's a microcontroller textbook, of course, all we had was a picture plus a thousand words to try to get this across. So, <clears throat> so being able to have something that takes you step by step and notice that I plugged in this resistor kind of sticking up into the air, which actually uh, corresponds to, for those of you who know your electronics, <laughs> a resistor with nothing connected to it yet. So I, I split that step up from connecting it to the power, oh, darn it. Pardon me while I try to get back to that slide and then get back to the spot in the slide. All right, so yeah, and then another, okay, so here is, see if I can do this without hitting the next slide. Um, 
All right, so it's about to plug into the red row and then we red column and then we see the 3.3 volts. We've got a magnified version so that it, it, which you again can pause at in order to really make sure that your circuit is right, even using a magnifying glass. All right, uh, so then the uh, last item is the, uh, I had this in the engineering workbook, but I really think that I wanna move it to the main activity. Um, what we're doing here is we're measuring first the total power or the total voltage, then the voltage across the resistor, 1.2 volts, the voltage across the LED, 2.06 volts. And uh, that's pretty much it for this one. Um, so we're starting off measuring no voltage potential. Then we go to the red and the blue columns for 3.2 volts, that's the supply voltage then the LED and notice that we're also showing where those probes are being applied on the schematic. So these are things that allow both teachers and students to go step-by-step -step through this material and um, to, to hopefully gain um, in-depth insight into how things really work. So with all that shown to you, my big questions are, um, well, First of all, uh, let's see here. Why, so the bullet points are just why the MP4 videos are good. But my questions for you are the two below that, which is um, how would you want these deployed? For example, if it turns out that, um, that right now, the way we have it in the lesson, um, so for example, here we are in the lesson and uh, sure, we've got this GIF and then we have the optional MP4. Well, what if it turns out that, that um, it would, it, what, if it, what if we're unable to support all the MP4 downloads on this particular site? Uh, for schools, where should they go? Is YouTube, for example, would we think we'll be able to keep them on the site, but maybe we want to have larger videos that that uh, you know contain actual visual and audio um, information that that are larger than these little um, gifts. If we do that kind of stuff and we include links and we're and it's it's too large to serve on the learn.parallax.com site where would be the best place to get it so that you are supported in the lessons? And um, also, uh, do you have any concerns about, um, you know, what a classroom using video training material, uh, overloading the network? Um, uh, so that's some, dis some discussion I wanted to hear. So any, anything that you guys can tell me, please do tell me. Uh, for example, is YouTube, I remember YouTube used to be not allowed at schools, but- Andy, uh, I think uh, YouTube unlisted video, so they're not browsed, but they're in a playlist that goes with the series of books, and then you can insert the video. Um, okay, so I didn't get that, but <laughs> for those of you teachers who got it, um, or if, if, if you'd like to re-say it, Ken, so that, because um, because basically I'd like to get everybody's, you know, I'd like to get the collective input so that we know that we're that we have a backup of of whatever is right for schools and whatever is best to make stuff available. So yeah, my suggestion was um, a YouTube playlist that goes with the tutorial series. Upload the video to YouTube, publish it as public, unlisted for children. Insert YouTube link into tutorial slides. Okay. Now, um, if any teachers would not be able to have their students access that in the classroom, please speak up now. Otherwise we'll go with that. Or rather, please speak up sometime either now in the chat, in an email later, any of that's fine. Uh, we really wanna hear from you. We wanna make the material available to you in a way that your students can, can access and use it and in a way that you can access and use it. You know, Andy and uh, and Ken, YouTube's a great resource. Uh, I think more districts are are using that more. But one thing we always deal with is the IT policies change 
constantly. So one day it works for the students fine. They come back the next day and it's blocked. So um, that's something, you know, that it's always seems like uh, different districts deal with that in different ways. So it's, but YouTube's a, probably the most common source. So I think more and more, it's going to be the, the source of choice for most districts to store things there. And then like Ken said, use a, uh, you know, if you publish it as a link, you can get to it without uh, all the other YouTube garbage. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you. So we will, um, we will take that and continue with it. And again, you know, if, if, if any of you want to follow up later with that, if, if you've, uh, if you've gained extra experience that, um, feel we should be aware of, please do share with us. Um, we'll uh, give you an email address at the end of the video. Can I give one more input on that, Andy? Yes, please. Um, so some other experience I had was when we published them as videos for kids, then the schools don't block them readily. And when you publish for kids, then there's no commenting available, which we don't need anyway. Oh, okay. Well, that that really simplifies things. Also, Thanks. I've seen that there's a, a education channel that can be created. So uh, we might look into creating a parallax education channel in, a, in addition to uh, some of the other stuff we've got. OK, so we have 12 minutes left. Trying to think if we we can try one real time example. I don't think we'll be able to get to both of them. Uh, does everybody still want to see? I, I, I heard that there was, were requests to show a, a real example of, of building a circuit. Do we still want to do that? I'm getting kind of head nods. Nobody's, Nobody's saying no. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I'll take silence to be a cent then. Um, all right. How's this look? It's a little fuzzy, isn't it? Hopefully it's visible. No, it looks okay. great. Okay, good, good, good. Now, um, so I think what we'll start with is just basically uh, this um, light emitting diode circuit here. Uh, and this is one that uh, the posted tutorial uh, currently has, um, you know, this is basically something that you're following step by step already. Um, and so, great, I forgot to open a folder. There we go. All right. Um, I normally store my scripts as the hex files that, uh, that the microbit editor allows you to um, download. And uh, so in the interest of time, as opposed to typing at real time, I think I will just start by dragging and dropping stuff. Uh, this is one that, that you can download from the learn.parallax.com examples that I pasted into the chat earlier. Um, and well, actually, no, this is, this is, um, this is uh, kind of a souped up version, goodness. Okay, let's start with the basics first. There we go. All right, so this is one that was downloaded and then opened in the microbit editor. And so we'll go ahead and connect and darn my luck, no microbit connected. Let's see here. Mm, could Too many be the problem. Could... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try plugging in the microbit. It's not the wireless USB model yet. No, no, not yet. <laughs> Okay, so there's my micro bit. And then let's see if, well, there it is now. Okay. So, um, all right. Um, so I'll go ahead and load this uh, code in. And I'm doing things a little bit out of order here. Um, so here is the voltmeter display, which I don't have connected yet. Um, so uh, the way the voltmeter works, and again, this is part of the tutorial, is uh, these little three pin headers that are sticking up uh, right next to P0 and P2. And again, there's really nice close-ups of this um, in the animated GIFs and uh, also in the MP4s. 
Um, so th this is the way you would connect your little voltmeter probes. And, uh, and so we're at about zero volts right now because I don't have them connected yet. So let's try measuring the voltage across the resistor. And all right, so there we go. And we've got 1.37 volts. Um, it might be difficult to see, but the resistor or the LED circuit is on. If I unplug the resistor, the LED circuit turns off. And if I plug it in, it's back on, off, on. Hopefully that was visible, off, on. All right. Um, well, that's not really the most productive way to turn a light on and off. So let's try automating that with uh, the um, with the uh, microbit. So um, a simple adjustment to the program. I'll go ahead and get rid of the voltmeter measurements. Or actually, I want to show you quickly. Um, we can also measure it in the cyberscope. Uh, and um, so th this again is is uh, straight out of out of the tutorials. Um, so I'll I'll load that in, and um, now the um, the messages are or the voltage measurements are are being formatted for the cyberscope, as opposed to uh, for the casual viewer. Whoopsie. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so I'll go ahead and disconnect and then go to cyberscope.parallax.com. Now, uh, this it may not appear this way for you. This is a very early development version that we're making available for early adopters to evaluate and provide feedback. Uh, the first thing I want to emphasize is that when you connect, it looks exactly like what's going on with the uh, Python editor that the Microbit Foundation has. and um, and uh, Right now we're seeing a, a line um, and it's a little wiggly and that's because of a um, uh, not that that's because of an issue that is being worked on and by the time this is ready for classrooms, uh, the, the micro bit will uh, not exhibit any hiccups in its analog measurements. Um, so here it is one point. 27 volts is the real measurement and every once in a while it gets hit by a little little voltage mis mismeasurement, which is why you see the 1.14. Um, so that's the cyberscope. And, uh, and again, it has a currently voltmeter and oscilloscope, but uh, there's lots of additional measurement equipment that we can emulate with um, the, uh, the microbits analog channels. So I'm really excited about that. And that's basically going to continue to be developed as we um, as we move forward with the tutorials, then the next things I'll be adding are a second analog channel uh, for the oscilloscope and the uh, resistance and current meters, um, which are pretty much equally simple to what we see here on the uh, on the alligator clips. There's there's very little circuit complexity to it, um, but yet you can get some pretty cool measurements. All right, so the automation part would be. Um, and this is a lesson that is not published yet, but basically um, there's, uh, there's information like if you want to know what uh, sleep is about, you can go to the, uh, the documentation. The, the link is provided right in the python.microbit.org editor. And, um, and we can just search for sleep, which I did earlier to make sure that we could find the answer. Uh, helps to hit enter. And um, microbit.sleep. Boom. And so it explains that you're waiting a certain number of milliseconds. So um, the reason I, I wanted to uh, mention that is because uh, if, I'm, if I'm using certain st uh, statements, uh, you can look them up. All right. So to uh, turn the light on, we have to adjust the circuit slightly. So I'm basically going to take this. Uh, this lead of the LED. This one right here, which is just plugged into power. And I'm going to plug it into um, a uh, pin labeled P14. 
on the microbit edge adapter. There we go. Okay, so let's see if I can get a uh, better shot of that. Focus. There we go. So do you see P14 now? And then in the same row of five sockets, we've got that little resistor plugged in. Then of course it goes to the LED circuit. And I'll refocus. Ah, oh, there we go. I think that looks pretty clear. Okay, so um, let's see here. Um, digital right. No, right digital. Pardon me, pin 14 dot right digital. One. Okay, so then we'll go ahead and uh, take these two statements and copy and paste them. And then we'll make this zero. So sending a one will connect to 3.3 volts. Sending a zero will connect the, the same circuit to, um, to zero volts. And there'll be a half a second in between. I'm actually gonna make that a whole second because otherwise it won't display very well on the broadcasted video. But students will wanna see how fast they can make it blink. Okay, and um, slightly obscured by jumper wires, we now have our blinking light. Okay, so that's, um, that's a really simple example. And of course, um, this is one of the things that's uh, coming up very soon that will appear in the documentation. Um, so that's a, a real-time demo of uh, the usage of the tools in the board. Um, granted, it's uh, something where we have built-in lights on the microbit, but hey, now students can have fun. They can learn what's inside the light circuit and they can make it green or yellow or red or actually any color they want because we also have an RGB, a red, green, blue LED in the kit. Okay, so on to the last question. Um, looks like I got a minute left, so we're gonna make this question quick. Um, if there is additional material that is uh, seen as maybe um, too challenging or scary, what's the best thing to do with that? Is it better to just to put it on a page that you can follow a link to um, that, and then call it optional so that, and then, and then in the teacher notes, we would, um, we would and to, uh, and to the to your point, Andy, or to clarify what you're asking, the 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 scary um, term that you're using is is more about the the deeper dive, the electrical engineering side of things. Um, to when you're getting down into um, yeah, so there, Tim Tim's asking it too. You know what is what do you mean by scary? And so it's really you know what is the um, the math behind the circuits, the the electrical engineering kind of understandings of what it is because uh, you know, if you put yourself in your student's shoes, they wanna build something and move along. Um, you know, I don't wanna deal with all the boring <laughs> theory of what's actually happening. They just wanna build, get the light blinking and move on. Um, so that, that next layer, you know, that deeper down understanding of, okay, why is this happening? Why is this working? Um, that sort of material, where does that go? Does that, is that a link or is that a different, uh, a different site? Is it just a hidden? Uh, so for example, I've been calling it the engineering workbook. This is this is my working draft. Um, and so this is what our editor uh, takes and corrects and posts on the web. It, it starts here in a Google Doc. Um, and so uh, what I did was I said, okay, well, we'll just make an engineering workbook page. And then on that page, we have the non qualitative stuff. We have the quantitative stuff. And we also have uh, some of the deeper dive that um, Tommy was referring to. For example, Kirchhoff's voltage law. Um, 
and Kirchhoff's current law, which I don't have illustrated yet. Uh, so these are things that are very important in some programs and to some teachers and, and for some students to learn, especially if they're going you know, into engineering, um, to have a, a first experience with it here. But there's, there's some concern about putting it in with the rest of the lessons. And because uh, I know that teachers uh, who are more focused on maker and STEM stuff uh, when, if they have a student running up saying, hey, you know, I'm really stuck on this, and you look and go, heck, Kirchhoff's voltage what? Um, you know, that, that could be problematic. So I'm looking for guidance from you all on how best to make that available, but also how to separate it from the main series of lessons. Is a PDF the best thing? Is just a, a uh, because right now what I did is, um, pardon me for scrolling here, it's close by, um, learn more. Okay, so in the main lesson, what I said is basically, here's a link to that engineering workbook stuff for this particular lesson you just did. So if you want to learn the engineering stuff, follow this link. Is that okay? You know, Andy, I, I like the that idea. I'm thinking this is a great introduction uh, but for my students, it would be very basic. And so I want some of that. Uh, and I'm thinking maybe, you know, starting off, this is a real great option for middle school, junior high, but to take it to the next level in high school, they need some of that. So I like the idea of having a link. If it was a PDF, they, it's just not as useful, not as helpful. Okay. The engineering okay. workbook could also include not just, uh, you know, the theory behind it maybe, but also uh, modifications, uh, you know, to- Oh yeah. <laughs> complexity of the circuitry, you know, things like that, you could, that would be a great option for, uh, for taking it to the next level, whether you want to call it an engineering workbook or, you know, take it to the next level or dive deep or whatever you call it, that concept. I like that. Okay. And um, again, we're, we're interested in everybody's feedback, whether it comes through the chat or whether it comes through an email after this or a phone call. We really want to hear from you because we want to be doing the right thing. Now, another uh, question I had before uh, we wrap it today is about the questions, exercises, and projects. Um, so I'm including some summative material here um, in the draft, but this has not made it to the... Um, that now, normally what I used to do in books is I used to write twice as much as we'd need. And then half of it was in the book at the end of the chapter, but solved. And then the other half was reserved for teachers to incorporate however they wanted to in homeworks, quizzes, labs, et cetera. So for every section, I've written questions, exercises, and projects and included solutions. And um, we're not exactly sure how that fits into the web uh, presentation. Um, my thinking is that there would be a separate page with a link and you would click the link to see the solutions. Um, and so I wanted to get your idea on that, that, that we'd still publish half the solutions on separate pages and then leave the other half available in the teacher only downloads area for you all to set up uh, any, any homework or exams or quizzes or labs. What do you guys think of that? Oh, and incidentally, um, I this is intentionally, this is not going to be updated unless you really want to see it updated because I, I wanted to kind of have the drawn in with the flare marker aspect of the solution here. Comment for the teachers. So that the teachers prefer the teacher only access, they need to log into our educator site with a login and password, which we provide. Oh, thank you, Ken. But um, this is really up to you to do, uh, to get that material, because for many of our curriculum, half of the content is buried you know, behind the login for the teachers, including the PowerPoint slideshows, the, the um, assessment material, you know, and you really need to go to a length. You have to ask for it to get it. So you get it by sending an email to education at parallax.com. 
and then we verify your teacher, then we provide you a login and password and you can change your password. Yeah, so this is what it looks like on the screen before you have logged in. Um, it's in the educator resources section. So click educators. Then um, it, uh, it's not up yet, but there'll be a, uh, a WAM with Python resources. So we're, I'm using the Cyberbot as an example. And then uh, there's some public materials that we have available, strategy guides, slide support, standards matrix. Those are all, those aren't answered. So those aren't solved questions. So they're not of concern, but uh, for the solved questions, we're keeping those only for the teachers. And uh, here we have education at parallax.com. So like if you, if you're already, you know, if you already have access, you'd hit log in and then you'd get all the downloads. If you don't already have access and you can be verified as a teacher, um, suggest an email from your teacher account, because that way, um, we don't even have to bother you with any kind of proof. We can just look, look you up at your school district, verify that that's your email, and then respond and, and send you instructions for um, how, to, uh, how to sign up. <laughs> Somebody forgot their password, yep. Uh, there, there's a way to get that. I don't know the details. <laughs> Maybe Ken does. <laughs> yep, just ask for a reset. Okay. Andy, can you speak to the extent of this in terms of uh, number of pages or tutorials that it will be, and then to what level of circuit build we will have? Okay, so um, going back fine. to the example, uh, so this is the posted example, and again, I'll I'll uh, I'll post that into the chat one more time. Paste. Uh, so this is an example of. Um, basically setting up your breadboard. And it's, um, it's fairly extensive. There's quite a few little sub pages that you go through and learn little pieces and uh, do little, little activities, be it taking measurements or learning about interconnections, then taking measurements, or well, then setting up the circuit, um, then downloading the script, uh, then taking your measurements. And this is actually just showing how a continuity tester would work. And then you get to move on and, and, and uh, learn about what continuity is, you know, have, which is basically an electrical connection and learn about how the code works. And then, um, you know, I didn't really see, uh, didn't really see the, oh, Okay, let's try, um, there we go, node tests. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Um, I, I thought there was, uh, maybe it was in the try this. Yeah, it's the try this. This is where you're doing, um, so, so in, there are videos about how to, uh, about how interconnections happen. And this is a clip of actually testing all of those uh, connections that were displayed as either connected or not connected in the video. And uh, you'll see a little um, circle slash for not connected and a little check mark when it is connected. And then of course the uh, magnifying glass is helpful for, there's a check mark because those two wires are connected. Um, so as far as the extent goes, um, this is one small part. And um, I, I think this can fit a semester. And um, uh, there, there's a fairly lengthy list of, of circuits that the students will be experimenting with. And then we salt in um, an appropriate number of concepts along with each circuit and each new thing that the students do with the circuit. Um, this isn't the most exciting of the steps that that comes later on. Uh, and again, that's, that's stuff that I'll be uh, showing you that the more wow value stuff is coming in um, March on the 23rd. So stay tuned. Yes. <laughs> we'll see you guys come back on uh, to the next session in March. We'll see some more developments with this. Um, get a few of these things ironed out. Andy's going to work on this, um, his uh, yellow LED animation. <laughs>
on that screen. <laughs> well, <laughs> again, this is this is this. Well, look is at that imitating... resistor. It's a transparent resistor. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, this this is imitating what a student would do with a set of flare markers and a printout of of uh, of the um, of the LED circuit they just built. And so, <laughs> oh, I forgot. Oh, yeah, I know. I thought that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, here's the lesson roadmap. I think I forgot to share this out. Let me um, make sure it's shared. Share. Got to make sure everybody can get in. Um, Andy, while you get that ready, I was wondering too, any other input or comments from these valuable educators here? Uh, it matters a lot. We have, you know, X number of you here online still. So whatever you'd like to share with us, this is a really good time to do it. You know, whether it's about your class, the fit for your class, a level of complexity you'd like us to um, strive for in this series. Uh, yeah, Ken and Andy and Tommy. Uh, so my students, I, I had them do the, they worked on the cyberbots for the first time in the fall. Uh, worked really good overall. Um, it was a bit of a pain with the IT department. Again, uh, even working, uh, you know, Chromebooks, they, you know, how you have to uh, install um, libraries basically for the, uh, they'd come back the next day, everything would be wiped. They'd have to reinstall you know, every uh, time they'd go to start the program that, you know, whatever uh, libraries they would need to get the micro bit to work, they'd have to put on every day. Now, Ron, can I show you a tip for that? Sure. Is there a, a good workaround? Yes. Or at least I, I believe you will see this to be a good workaround. All right. So here we are in, uh, oh, I got to share, right? No, I'm still sharing. Okay. Yeah, I can see your screen. Yeah, um, the main thing to do, for, and this is an example of it right here. So that this multimeter um, example is using a library. It's using right. the multimeter uh, module is the, the name. And that module is right down here as multimeter.py. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna download this as a hex file first. Okay, so I'm gonna download the entire project, boom. Okay, so now I have measure volts number six in my downloads. Okay, now I'll remove the hex file. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, now I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna kill the hex file, uh, boom. Okay, so now I, I mean, I'm going to remove the measure volts module, not doing the hex file. All right, so now this is not gonna work properly because the, uh, the program is saying, hey, you need this module, but it's not in the project anymore. So when I download it, it's, it's gonna show a frowny face on the micro bit and then we'll see this message saying that it cannot find the module. Well, if you have saved it as a hex file, and you have it, say, on a thumb drive or whatever, all you have to do is drag it, in my case, from downloads onto the screen, onto the editor. Now it's arrived at the editor. And guess what? Multimeter's right. back. Yeah, and that's what the students were basically doing, but they have to, you know, they'd have to redrag it in every day. Um, yeah, okay, so that I can't get them passed. <laughs> right, and that's just the IT department's wiping the, you know, the machines every night, so, or, you know, keeping it uh, clean up, so I yep. told them, you know, guys, just, yeah, just keep track of what you need to import, and you know how to import it real fast, so. Well, again, once you have the hex file, you don't yeah, need to can... manually import. It's just it's it's in there. As soon as you as soon as you yeah. drag your hex file and drop it, it's basically like opening your project or opening your file. Okay. And and so that's that's um I, I'm harping on it because I I want every teacher here to know that trick because it's very important because because right. anytime we have these custom modules, uh, by virtue of the fact that you've saved it as a hex file. Uh, you don't have to repeat the steps of going in here and 
and saying, oh, geez, I've got to add a file again, and then browsing to find the file, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so you can skip that step just by having it as that nice little hex file package by downloading Project Hex. Right. One of the issues, though, you know, is you got to download that and save it somewhere. Yes. That's what's getting wiped out by, uh, you know, our school's IT. They, they clean yep. up kids. Any downloads they do, the next day they come in, they're not there. Do they let them use thumb drives? Um, yeah. Um, so that I guess that would be the next the next easiest workaround. Yeah, or if they have, say, a, a you know, Google some of them Google Drive account, their own uh, laptop, you know, so they could save it. You know, it worked great instead. But if I had my, you know, like say the kids were on Chromebooks, yep. Um, you know, then it, they they just wipe out all their downloads. So. Yeah, that that would nuke the downloads folder. Um, do they have with with the Chromebooks? Do they have uh, Google Drive accounts? Because you might be able um, to. Yeah, some of them. Uh, you know, I, I think they, you, they could do it that way. Right. Yeah, because you could basically go to drive.google.com yeah. and then um, and then drag it onto your drive. Yeah, so they they ran into that and quickly found what worked fastest for each of them. They decided, you know, different things, different okay. workarounds that way. Great. So that's yeah. a good question. I like the thumb drive idea. Maybe it'd be just quicker to sell them, just bring a thumb drive each day. Yeah, it's it's been working very nice for me. I, I keep a, a separate drive when I when I need to um, actually say share them with our editor. I'll use the sneaker net, as in put them on a thumb drive and <laughs> use my sneakers to go down the hallway and drop the thumb drive on her desk. <laughs> right, but yeah, they they uh, really had a good good experience with them. They I think they really liked the uh, they liked the uh, cybersecurity, uh, you know haven't had that option before we were running into all kinds of problems because of, you know, not, we just couldn't teach that at all with, you know, had a good platform because of the IT department blocks, you know, tons. So having that two radios on those different uh, micro bits able to do that was really cool. They liked that. So that is working. I am so delighted to hear that because that was our, our primary reasoning behind doing the cybersecurity lessons that we did with the microbit. Thank you so much for that verification. Yeah, that's good, good feedback that we need. Yeah, you're welcome. Wow. Um, Katie Henry, are you available uh, possibly to ask some questions after the, um, the main presentation? I have uh, some technical challenges regarding making the um, making this little guy right here, the, the cyberscope. Um, I think that your web developers have uh, know, know some important um, internal information on how to make it so that anybody, because uh, when you go to the, to the microbit editor right here, you can just connect and disconnect and Chrome does not try to protect you from yourself. But if you're, uh, say, a, a third-party uh, web page provider who is using the same tools, granted, uh, it looks fine for me right now. Uh, but what really happens is, uh, let's see if I can find the tutorial. Andy, as we move into that, um, for Katie connects you with whoever it is at Microbit to help, we should probably round up, say thank you to everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming here. And huge thanks, Andy and Tommy, for where you guys are headed with this. This is awesome. And I'm looking forward to it and learning from it, too. And I wanted to give a shout out to my uh, one of my favorite professors who's on here. He taught me in my undergrad classes, Dr. Steve Armstrong. Big fan of Parallax now. But uh, he's uh, one of the ones that helped me grow from just doing P-Basic on a, on a basic stamp and to bigger and better things and actually teaching computer science myself in high school. So um, thanks, Dr. Armstrong, for being here. Yeah, thank you for coming. And um, also uh, a couple final things are <clears throat> we the education at parallax.com. If you have any afterthoughts to share about the presentation, um, education at parallax.com is going to be the best place to email. Both Ken and I see that. Um, and then, of course, there are some other uh, nice things like the educator hotline. If you are stuck on anything, uh, 
in terms of implementing it for your students or need help on what to choose if you're um, trying to set up a kit for your class. And we are Parallax. Andy, and nice work. Thank you're you so much. <laughs> you too, Ken. I've been with you guys my whole career and I love you guys very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's super rewarding to hear where your students go and to see people learning so much for so many years. And uh, that's that's our currency. So thanks. Okay, and I'll thank stop you, the recording. Tommy and everyone at cyber.org. And anyone who wants to stay on can stay here with Andy and ask him any questions too. Actually, I Andy, wanna... I have two students just... that have applied for uh, MIT and they're in phase two. So two out of one class. Can you believe it? Congratulations. Really oh man, I'm really praying for them. That would be the pinnacle of my career. <laughs> well, we'll hold a good thought for you too. And then Katie, I think you unmuted briefly. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you very much to Andy, Tommy and Ken for an amazing presentation. I'm very excited about this curriculum. And I've already sent a message to our CTO with your question about that web USB um, pairing. So I'll see if I can get the secret sauce to you. Yeah, and I, I, I'm hoping it's just that I put a little thing uh, with the microbits unique identifier in it, uh, because that's super easy. But if there's uh, some under the hood work, um, whatever information just basically leads, because I'm hoping we can take care of the rest. But it's, it's just knowing, knowing how you guys did it, because it, boy, it sure is 